the shocking and tragic murder of Brooke Preston sent shockwaves through her family and the community, leaving them desperate for answers. As we grapple with the heart-wrenching details of the case, we find ourselves entangled in a web of questions surrounding the events that culminated in this unfathomable crime. Join me as we embark on a journey into the depths of Brooke Preston's murder, meticulously dissecting the intricate narrative that shrouds this unsettling incident. A life extinguished too soon, a family left in mourning. The tale of Brooke Preston's murder grips us with its chilling intrigue, but we'll soon find out. The path to understand that his tragedy takes us through the twists of a story that defies easy explanation. On March the 25th of 2017, 21-year-old Brooke Preston was brutally stabbed to death by her roommate and childhood friend, Rand Herman Jr. in their West Palm Beach, Florida home. The facts surrounding the murder are clear, as Herman himself called 911 and confessed to the killing. Yet, amidst this apparent clarity, lies a shadow of doubt cast by Adam's astonishing defense, an assertion that the fatal act was committed during the throes of a severe hangover. The true motives and the enigmatic circumstances of the crime continue to elude our grasp, to unravel the layers of complexity that led to this heart-wrenching tragedy. It's of vital importance that we plunge headfirst into the intricate fabric of the relationship shared by Randy Herman Jr. and Brooke Preston. Their friendship, which was a convoluted tapestry of emotions and connections, laid the foundations for the events that would eventually unfold. And as we delve into this narrative, we encounter a mosaic of emotions, motivations, and decisions that painted the backdrop of this grim tale. The setting of the story finds Brooke Preston on the brink of a new chapter in her life, one that was poised to unfold in the bustling streets of New York. You know, New York, New York, so good they named it twice. Well, you don't know that one? Check it out. Anyway, she was going to join her boyfriend in pursuit of new dreams, and yet beneath the surface of this impending journey, a tension was beginning to simmer between her and Randy Herman, her long-standing confidant and roommate. We're trying to find out exactly what transpired. Like I said, your mom's going to have questions. And we know that. And listen, that's obvious. We know that you're, that you're sorry for it. We need to get in touch with Brooke's family. No. We need to let them know. Their friendship, which was once characterized by sheer laughter and mutual understanding, has started to fray the edges, revealing intricacies that would later prove pivotal. What brought you to Florida? Okay. And you moved with Jordan and Brooke? Okay. So you all came down together at the same time, July last year, or separate? You all come at different times? Okay. Were you guys all friends back in Pennsylvania? Okay. So you all knew each other, same area? Are you all roughly the same age? Okay. Herman was known to wrestle with personal demons in the form of alcohol, and he grappled with his inner struggles as the day in question dawned. This day, which would etch itself into the annals of history, was marked by his immersion in an excessive quantity of beer. Yes, he decided to get extremely drunk. An attempt which perhaps was known to drown his woes or null his inner turmoil. The choice he made, which was to surrender to the allure of alcohol, would cast a shadow over the path that led ahead. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casted an and the glow up of the shared abode that they had in West Palm Beach. The dynamic between Preston and Herman grew increasingly strained. And bear in mind they're just friends. No accounts of them would be anything more. But it appears as if one of them had some unrequited feelings, we shall say. And the fragile nature of their friendship was highlighted by Herman's intoxicated state, which basically was straining Preston's patience to the limits. Who wants to be around someone who's just frankly pissed? This alcohol haze that it had enveloped him had eroded the boundaries of reason. You're going to see this later on, so be mindful of this. And their interactions were tinged with the awkwardness that often accompanies drunk people. You know, the mind is not very straight when you're drunk, and Herbert had reportedly yet this consumed more than 30 beers. 30. 3 0. 
30 beers. I'm surprised he could stand up. Faced with all this discomfort and the uncertainty, Brooke decided, yeah, you know, then be leaving for a while. So she left, went to the sort of mutual friend, and in making that choice, she unknowingly altered the course of events and set into motion the sequence of occurrences that would reverberate through time. The night unfolds. The foundation of their friendship has been rocked under the weight of his unresolved emotions, the alcohol-induced misunderstandings that he had, and the decision that she took which pushed them onto separate paths for the evening. Each step that was taken, each emotion that was suppressed, carved deeper breathing into the narrative, leading relentlessly towards the tragedy that would ensue in the hours to come. As the night surrendered to the tentative embrace of dawn, the weight of the events hung heavy in the air, a tangible reminder of the fraction dynamics between Randy Erman Jr. and Brooke Preston, and the dawn's light would reveal a scene that was drenched in melancholy, with the fury of the sun casting its golden hues upon the home where a once thriving friendship now seemed to hang by the thinnest thread. Do you know where she stayed last night? At a friend's house. Do you know what the friend's name is? What's the friend's name that she stayed with? Kyle. Kyle. Where does Kyle live? Does he live around you? Around West Palm somewhere? Okay. What time did Brooke go to Kyle's house? The new day unfolded with its own set of foreboding hopes as the aftermath of Herman's night of basically pissing it up began to manifest itself in the throes of a merciless hangover. We all know it goes, well, most of us do. Long night, plenty of drinking, plenty of drinking, even more, plenty of drinking. His head was pulsing with the relentless rhythm. Each beat, a reminder of the choices he'd made and the consequences he was yet to fully comprehend. So, amidst this physical and emotional torment, a weary but remorseful Herman found himself amidst the remnants of the life he'd shared with Brooke Preston. The act of helping her pack her belongings felt like a, a sort of march towards a future that had been rewritten by the events of the preceding night. The shared memories, the laughter, and the secrets that once colored the walls of their abode seemed to echo distantly as they navigated the silence that enveloped them. And then came the moment of parting, a poignant, almost surreal exchange. They would later be etched into Herman's memory as Brooke Preston embarked on the journey toward her new life. Herman stood as a sentinel at the doorway of his room, watching her recede into the corridors of their shared history. His testimony of fragile lifeline woven from the threads of his fragmented recollections, claims that he witnessed her leave his room, her presence evaporated into the day's embrace. That's what he claimed, or fallen. Twist of fate that defied comprehension, a sequence of events that spiraled into a realm where reality and nightmare converged. The embrace of sleep claimed Herman once more, pulling him into its murky depths with a deceptive gentleness. Did you actually go to bed last night? Okay. Did Brooke go to bed last night? She stayed somewhere else. She she came back. Do you know where she stayed last night? At a friend's house. In that fleeting space between slumber and wakefulness, Herman's consciousness roused from its slumber. His eyes adjusted to the dim light that was filtering through the curtains, revealing a sign that would haunt him forever. Brooke Preston's lifeless form, bathed in cold light. Reality's dagger pierced his befuddled mind, and his gaze unlocked onto the knife in his trembling hand, his blade stained with damning evidence. Time stood still, innocence and guilt suspended, memory offered young Saunders leaving him, stranded in his self-created nightmare. She came back. Okay. I gave him a shirt. The room whispered of unspoken horrors and echo of the unthinkable, and in the grip of this 
chin in realization, and his trembling fingers bowed his form, his heart pounding in his chest as he dialed 911. Through a voice filled with dread, he confessed to a truth beyond horror. And you called up 911, and you said that there was a murder. Okay. okay. And then you said, I'm at the park. When I asked you what happened, you said, I'm the one that did it. I'm sorry. All right? Okay. You remember telling that to the 911 operator? Randy? Okay. The truth that demanded Alice's retribution and the reckoning with his own unfathomable actions. On March the 25th of 2017, the narrative of tragedy unfolded. 21-year-old Brooke Preston, her life extinguished, her body cold, lay victim to a brutal act. A sense of unease settled over Halo Hill Park, the stage where the grim epilogue of Brooke Preston's life would be unveiled. The once tranquil rebellion now bore silent witness to a scene of chilling disarray, a tab below painted in shades of dread. The police arrived and the sirens cut him through the stillness of the evening like an anguished cry. Flashing lights cast an eerie glow, casting distorting shadows that danced upon the pavilion surface. And amidst all this surreal backdrop stood Randy Hurton Jr., his presence marked by the stark contrast of crimson stains against the backdrop of his disheveled attire. Blood, plenty of blood, both his own and another's painted a grim narrative across the scene. His hand, which bore a crude tapestry of wounds, served as a painful testament to a violent struggle, a struggle that had unfolded with an intensity that left its mark upon his flesh and psyche alike. But the revelations were far from contained within the confines of the pavilion. The tendrils of the tragedy extended to their shared dwelling, a place that once echoed with the warmth of companionship. Here, however, the scene was a canvas of horror, an unfiltered snapshot of an irreversible act that had shattered the bonds of friendship forever. You need to let me know what, what started it. Something started it, Randy. You got given her a t-shirt and the next thing you know, something happened, okay? What happened, Randy? Did you want her to leave? Randy, did you want her to leave? Did you want her to leave? It's a yes or no question. Did you want her to leave? You don't care. Okay. Did you guys argue? I don't think so. You don't think so? Then how did she get hurt? Within those walls, the presence of a hunting style. I spoke of Kent. A haunting reminder of a choice that defied reason. Its blade, the harbinger of Brooks' demise, gleamed ominously under the harsh scrutiny of forensic lights. The scene bore the imprints of a struggle, the room echoing with the unspoken cries of a violent confrontation. Now, amidst all of this stark violence, another detail emerged. Put Preston's hand marked by the traces of her own defensive resistance. The wounds etched upon her palm, the testimony to the struggle against the uncroaching darkness. The wounds etched upon her palm spoke of a desperate bit for survival that had ultimately been in vain as the investigators meticulously documented the grim scene, the weight of the tragedy loomed heavy. Now we come to the trial. You would not believe what the defense came off with, or maybe you would, because Randy Herman Jr.'s defense posed a quite startling assertion. Despite the fact that there was a hunting knife that had been purchased, the defense stated that he committed the murder while in a state of sleepwalking. Randy, what's the backstory, Randy? There's something there. Randy, there's something there. Well, you're going to have to do it. That's that's the problem. This isn't. This doesn't go away. This isn't do-overs. You don't get to excuse yourself away from it. It is what it is. The evidence is going to speak for itself. We sleep at night knowing we gave you an opportunity. Randy, look at me. I'm treating you like a man. Look at me so I can talk to you. I'm trying to treat you like a man. You do know. And the evidence is going to tell us exactly what happened. And Preston, uh, uh, Jordan Preston, the sister, is going to give us, tell us about what was going on with you and Brooke. I don't know. You didn't argue nothing happened. You don't know. You just lost it and went after her. I don't, I don't know. Now, this was met with skepticism, not only by the prosecution, but also by the attentive members of the jury. 
who bore witness to the unfolding courtroom drama. There was a clash of narratives inside the courtroom, each threat being meticulously woven by the opposing sides. Herman's defense mounted a case that was centered on a volatile combination of alcohol and apparent sleepwalking episodes from his past. Did you tell them everything you needed to tell them? Yes, yeah. How do you feel about the fact that your Preston died that morning? Terrible. I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. That's all the questions I have. They constructed a portrait of Hermit as a man adrift in the haze of his subconscious, guided by impulses he could not consciously control, leading him to commit the harrowing and gruesome act. Yet the prosecution had an alternative perspective. They wove together a story that pointed towards a motive which was far more human in nature. You came to South Florida from the state of Pennsylvania because your life was spiraling out of control, isn't that correct? That's correct. When you came to West Palm Beach from late 2016 through March of 2017, the time of the murder, you were still struggling with addiction, correct? That's correct. Your life was still spiraling out of control? It was. Unrequited feelings that Herman harbored for Preston. This was augmented by a deeply unsettling incident. Herman's naked intrusion into Preston's closet. And this action, according to the prosecution, signaled Herman's unresolved emotions that finally culminated in the ultimate act of violence. So amidst this legal tub of war, the jury found themselves tasked with the untangling of a web of competing narratives. The defense's sleepwalking theory, while compelling, seemed to falter in the face of the calculated brutality of the crime. And with regard to the defendant's limited window of time, could that have happened scientifically speaking? He's uh, wide awake minutes before for the crime. And you can't go from wide awake to sleepwalking in, in a matter of minutes. We know that Randy admitted being awake. The wounds that were inflicted upon Preston, the room was drenched in blood, and the apparent methodical nature of the act all cast a shadow of doubt upon it actuality of an act conducted while unconscious. You need to really stop for a moment. <laughs> Please tell me. Things were going downhill. Because, don't get it wrong, there have been cases where people have been found to have been sleepwalking and killed someone. So it's, there is no legal press. Sleepwalking. So the trial progresses. The tension in the courtroom's palpable. Spectators, legal teams, jury members all grappling with the weight of evidence that's been presented. Each new detail woven into the fabric of the case adds another layer of complexity to an already convoluted story, leaving everyone present to question the boundaries of human understanding and the depths to which our emotions can drive us. The defense had a compelling story, but the 12-person jury just wasn't moved by it. So they all get an, it's an, it's an intriguing theory, don't get me wrong, it was interested, but they weren't swayed. The prosecution clearly demonstrated that Herbert's actions didn't stem from him being unconscious or drunk, but there was a deeper motive. Basically, he wanted Preston, and he couldn't have her. He got drunk, and in his drunken state, the anger that he felt came to the fore and killed her. And the assistant state attorney, Reed Scott, dumped the final blow up to the sleepwalking defense when he said this is skin this is bone and this is muscle you're not going to sleepwalk through that kind of the nail in the coffin and the jury's collective nod affirmed the prosecution's argument and as the trial concluded randy herman jr was found in just a few moments you'll be taken to the jury room by the courtroom deputy for your deliberations even if you do not like the laws that must be applied, you must use them. And on behalf of both the state of Florida and on behalf of Mr. Herman, I want to thank you for those efforts. By the time that the trial ended, we got back into the deliberation room. We sat down. It was almost just a, a not a sigh of relief, but a sigh of, wow, let's get this information out and start talking about this right now. Guilty. There really wasn't much else that the jury could have done in this situation. It was a unanimous decision. Now, in a heart-wrenching testament to the tragedy's enduring impact, Brooks' sister, Jordan Preston, stated that 
A murder wasn't the result of mental instability. A murder was premeditated and 100% the result of a decision that Randy Lowe had made on March the 25th of 2017. The case should have ended there. Herbert's conviction to life without parole was the final, or so the Preston family thought. In 2020, there was a controversial Hulu documentary called Dead Asleep, which delved into the intricacies of the case. It dissects the nuances of the relationship between Herman and Preston, the potential hidden motives and the complexities that evade a simple explanation. Now, it must be noted that Jordan Preston has repeatedly asked for this documentary to be taken down, and it's my understanding that at this present time, it's still being shown. The haunting tale of Brooke Preston's tragic murder lingers on, an unsettling enigma that continues to stir debates and compel us to confront uncomfortable truths in the wake of her demise her roommate and childhood friend, Randy Herman Jr., was thrust. Guilty of first degree murder as charged in the indictment. Ultimately convicted for her murder, his audacious defense, which centered around the claim of committing the act while sleepwalking introduced an unexpected layer of complexity to the trial. However, the jury's final verdict shattered the narrative, condemning Herman to a life sentence behind prison walls. Beach, Palm Beach County, Florida, signed jury for person. That timeline that we drew up, and we drew it, we had all the text messages, we had time when she pulled in, when he pulled out, and after that timeline, everyone was on the same page. The defense's gamble on sleepwalking was born from Herman's mother's testimony, which involved a history of somnambulism, sleepwalking. But the prosecution, in their starts, posed a counter-narrative. They painted a portrait of Herman's feelings for Preston, an unrequited affection teetering on the edge of obsession. Previous unsettling acts served as brushstrokes on the disturbing canvas, suggesting that the crime might not have been an act of unconscious sleep, but rather one of agony and consciousness. And in the aftermath of the trial, we have a myriad of questions. The intricate dance between human behavior and the influence of alcohol takes center stage here again, unfortunately. All right. Randy Allen Herman Jr., a jury of your peers having found you guilty of first degree murder, I sent you to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Magnifying the consequences of unchecked intoxication, the frail boundary between sanity and the unfathomable depths of the human mind when marred by obsession and emotion is laid here before all of us. Sleepwalking as a defense? I'm not sure. The case does serve as a stark reminder of the dire consequences though of alcohol which is allowed to go unchecked and clouds your judgments and drives individuals down paths of inexplicable violence. It's a tragedy that didn't have to happen. And it's a chilling reminder of life's virginity and the profound consequences of our actions. And as discussions continue, her story remains as an indelible testament to the complexity of the human experience and the unfathomable depths to which emotions can propel us. So as we reflect on this tragic event, our thoughts remain with Brooke Preston, a loved ones. It's important to honor her memory by working towards a society that promotes understanding, empathy, and the prevention of violence. Thanks for watching. Would you rather wake up to a sleepwalking killer or a venomous snake slithering into your bed? Let us know in the comments section below.